All right, we are live with the one and only Sony Giandani. It is so nice to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, Sabrina. <laughs> As always, great to see you. Yeah, likewise. I mean, especially on sort of the heels of your latest large announcement. So thank you for making time for us. I have been thrilled this week, uh, just anticipating this conversation because it, you know, it really covers a lot, you know. Um, so I'm excited to just kind of dive in. You know, um, I know a lot of folks who have worked for you or with you and around you. You are synonymous with innovation and with disruption. You are just brilliant at it. And, and so I want to unpack a lot of that from a cultural perspective, from a leadership perspective, from a business and technology perspective. So in 20 minutes, we are going to just dive in. So for some folks who maybe don't know you or know your background, you know, you're, you have an incredibly diverse background. Obviously, you're a woman in technology. You're the chief business officer of Pensando. You have so much that would be very easy for people to stereotype you. You know, talk to us a little bit about how that's maybe impacted you or, you know, does it have to do with anything of, you know, sort of where you've landed? So, you know, if you think about it, right, in a span, in a career span of over 35 years, right, um, I've, I've, I've done the least stereotypic of typical things for an Indian woman from originating and born and brought up in India. I left India at a very young age uh, and I, I left for London and I became an engineer there. And as uh, I've always liked solving problems um, very quickly, though, as I entered the job market, uh, I moved into more of customer focused roles because there's no point in solving uh, a problem if no one really cares about it or, or you cannot use a particular solution. Right. And I've always believed in, in uh, being at the front end of definition, understanding where the market's going, where the customers are going. And I realized early on that understanding where the customer's needs are and having continuous feedback loop from the market is critical to being successful with any piece of innovation. Uh, it's very extremely easy to get carried away when you're surrounded by brilliant people and brilliant engineers who uh, may have the philosophy of let us build and they will come. Mm -hmm. uh, I have come from a different school uh, because very early on in my career, even though I, I, you know, I, I academically got through engineering school, my passion was really in understanding the market, understanding customer needs, understanding the applications of those technologies. So that's that, that's typically what, you know, how I've landed where I have landed, mm -hmm. uh, you know, looking at the uh, reflecting back at where I started and where I have landed and, and like, you know, and and of course, working with the team and working with group of individuals that are like minded uh, has played a very important role for me as well. As you know, we have spent 20 years prior to starting Pensando, spent 20 years at Cisco. Uh, and was part of a team that was responsible for many of uh, Cisco's market leading innovations and creating multi-billion dollar products. So we are all we all become, you know, associated with folks and getting and surrounding ourselves with people that are like minded. And and I consider myself to be very fortunate that I've been part of this team now uh, for close to 28, 29 years. Right. Uh, and that's what you bring up such a good point. I mean, a lot of what you've done remains multi-billion dollar businesses for other organizations, tech giants across the world, and still is some of their leading, you know, solutions for their portfolio, even exactly. after you've left. I mean, talk about a massive impact. And to do that in a way, to your point, where, you know, maybe you're pushing your teams that are still brilliant, which comes with egos and all of that, right? Um, just say, okay, maybe let's think about this a little bit differently. Maybe let's look at this just a little bit differently from the market perspective, from solving the, the customer's problem perspective. You know, I know you just came out with this recent launch and it, we were just talking offline about how, how you did that very thing in your recent launch. Talk to us a little bit about that. How do you get those kinds of insights? So I think a lot of it has to come with... Um, it's very important to recognize that 
you you have to create a playbook mm. when you embark on looking at any technology disruption there's got to be a playbook the playbook has to consist of multiple things one aspect is there's there's an art aspect of it in starting with a clean slate approach mm. you cannot if you're looking for disruption you cannot say how has somebody else tried to solve it and now let me try and make it incrementally better Mm-hmm. uh and and what do i mean by that I, very specifically you have to think about am i about to create a product which is category defining can it stand on its own as an individual as a unique category and then initially there has to be a high degree of creativity mm-hmm. and imagination to form a strong perspective on where things are going and timing it uh and and as a team that's where we've always started we've always believed if you're too early with something you're going to fail if you're too late doesn't matter somebody else has already solved it yeah. so making sure that you have the the ability to look at things from a out of box and a more creative and an imaginary way where which i think has a science element associated art element associated with it right and then once you have that perspective then it's easier to see the product and the market that's ripe for disruption Mm-hmm. disruption always creates opportunity so it's the best place to look if you want to start a company or you want to build very successful multi billion dollar products now once you've identified the problem the next step is to take a clean slate approach as i said to solve what is the mixture of the art and then the science portion and again you cannot apply science alone you have to apply the art portion first and then your solution has to get and and make sure your solution has a multi generational approach mm. um and and that incumbents can can easily not get into addressing it uh, mm-hmm. for your target audience and this is where the science will come in right and and the science portion is as follows find your lighthouse customers mm. you may not have to be the largest customer in that category but they have to be the early adopters determine who are the market makers not the leaders but the customers who everyone looks as the gold standard if this company did it i have to get there because they have always led mm-hmm. with new innovations so they are the ones you want to work with in a more because they're more likely to open to working with you and becoming a true partner they will not have to come in and say yes i agree with everything they will validate and correct your thinking and be a great use case so that you can have a replicable model moving forward Mm-hmm. and for us it has been the public cloud customers and it has been financial services companies and leaders like goldman sachs mm-hmm. who always have been one step ahead uh from from looking at where the technology needs to be at and where they need to be at as right. a financial institution the second one is the ecosystem who are the right partners within the space so that your solution can be more easily consumed and who are going to want to integrate it and cooperate to enhance their solution the 1 plus 1 equals 3 mm-hmm. and and that for us it's it's really the partnership that we had to bring forth for the enterprise customers it was the likes of hpe dell the vmware the splunks the fortinet uh, the palo alto networks it's that whole class of companies because the enterprise has one of a lot of things and they want to have the ability to consume it technology with which has been validated by systems players now both of these are clearly the one the two categories i said are science based it's a matter of understanding and not creating and imagining it mm-hmm. uh, so i think that portion is where the disruption playbook begins okay. the science portion playbook begins in terms of market ab- adoption and customer adoption and partner integration etc So you hit on a few things that already, you know, kind of get my brain going and and thinking, you know, as we talk about this sort of market place, you know, or market disruption playbook, um you talk about how there is this sort of art and science balance between the two and thank you by the way for kind of giving us your secrets and guidance there. But you hit on a couple things that I I think we we overlook um or frankly just don't realize that it starts with that level of creativity um where you're creating your own category i've never heard it put that way before you know we we kind of think of let's tweak it let's make it a little better and we see things 
you know, we see things in the market kind of happen that way, but that doesn't mean that that's how you truly disrupt. That's not disruptive. So you're looking already, you're making your canvas massive, saying, how do I create an entirely new category, not just make, you know, this, this solution a little bit better. Exactly. And that was a big, that was a big, like, aha for me when you said that, you know, the other thing you said is that disruption always creates opportunity. And I think so many of us are terrified of disruption. We say we want to innovate and, you know, we do a lot of work with some of the same, you know, partners that you talk about and they, that Pensando has, and they're struggling in some areas to, to really innovate because it's terrifying. Um, you know, so when you talk about disruption, always creating opportunity, how quickly does that come? Is that something, you know, that we can kind of maybe understand and be less fearful of disruption? Or is there something that we know, okay, wait a minute, you're actually going to have to sort of get there eventually. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. You know, I think in the current time, Sabrina, you know, take a look at, um, ingenuity right i mean who had foreseen that the that the way we are working is going to get disrupted with the virus right uh and and that the cloud is going to become a very important medium for us to uh to to come closer together and continue to bring ourselves to work at a faster pace right I mean, we are sitting here and, and we could be in different continents yeah. and we are having a very fine conversation. I mean, I don't need a big studio to go into and, and get, get ready to get broadcasted. Right. Uh, I could be, you know, and I'm not, I'm, I'm an <laughs> early riser. I could be in my pajamas uh, and, and not even start at my first cup of coffee and, and would be addressing a team of 100 people or 500 or 1,000 people. Uh, so the, I think the disruption is happening today at a faster pace than we have seen in the last 30 years. Yeah. Um, so I think it's all around us, to be honest with you, Sabrina. I think it's now taking a step back and looking at the, the, the areas that you want to focus on, that you're most passionate about, mm -hmm. and, and looking for what are the disruptions happening in that space. For us, after being at Cisco for almost two decades, the natural place to look was how is the pendulum swinging towards the public clouds? Right. What architectures are being deployed by the likes of Amazon? Uh, and what, what are the areas that we could now, coming five, seven years later, based on where Amazon started in the early two, you know, 2010, 2015 timeframe, what should we be doing for the next seven years? That's literally what we started with at Pensando. We said, we've come seven years and they have a seven-year-old architecture. Where do we want to be mm -hmm. as Pensando in the next four to five years so that when we start with a clean slate approach, we could democratize the cloud. We could make the cloud not just something that's only in the hands of Amazon, but really enable the rest of the market whether it's a leading edge enterprise like Goldman Sachs or whether it is the other public cloud vendors, leapfrog Amazon. So it's a matter of making sure that you can look at what disruptions are already occurring around you and where you can up the game, where mm -hmm. you can create a new category. And how do you start with a clean slate approach and who are going to be your customers uh, that you're going to partner with? And then try and make a playbook so that it can become a replicable model. Exactly. Exactly. And I think, you know, the fact that that is so terrifying is probably in a lot of ways what's helping fuel a lot of that creativity, you know, and as you're kind of looking at that market and seeing, OK, what's existing right now, you know, so we, you know, I want to I want to kind of dive a little deeper into this idea of innovation and, you know, how do you how do you really innovate? And we've talked about this offline in such a sort of conspiracy driven world, you know, um, because that's another piece that we kind of fall into as well. There's the fear side, but then there's, you know, maybe tied to fear, this conspiracy side. So do you have any guidance for what people can do and sort of how you innovate in this, you know, new market that we're in, this new world that we're in? Sure. I think openness is crucial. Be mm -hmm. open 
about what you're building, how it works, engage with your community of mm -hmm. users and non-users uh, alike. People tend to fear what they don't understand. And so when you talk to them and you tell them not to worry about it and just make their fears, it calms their fears and their jitters down a bit more. Be very clear on what you're doing, what you're not doing. Why are you doing what you're doing and how it works? So don't be afraid to share. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the, the the fear of the unknown is what we as humans uh, get very uncomfortable with. Mm -hmm. But I think once you can help overcome that with open communication and openness, I think you will find uh, uh, not only your own teams, but you will also find the community at large willing to open their perspective and come to the table and, and better embrace uh, what what ideas there could be and how they can even further improve upon what you're doing. Right. And, you know, so my background's in behavioral analysis. Anybody who follows me know I, I absolutely love it. And, you know, there's a lot of science. There's not a, a lot of like neuroscience and, and behavioral science behind what you're saying. In fact, there's these little things called mirror neurons in your brain that when you when you see somebody else being honest, somebody else being transparent, someone else being vulnerable, um, it actually fires up these mirror neurons and they feel like they can be more honest, more vulnerable, more creative. So it really does breed additional sort of transparency and openness and then partnership. You know, exactly. there's this build of, of sort of a cognitive dissonance that creates then a tighter partnership. Yes. So, so much of what you're saying is not just based off of, you know, decades and decades of your success. But there's true science behind what you're saying, you know, exactly. exactly. Yeah. It's fascinating. It's so fascinating, you know. So, you know, you're known for being a leader that really challenges people. I, like I mentioned earlier, have just a wealth of, of great close friends. In fact, my own business partner, uh, Joanna Sig, so many people who are so fond of you and have worked for you and have followed you really across any crazy idea, any, you know, um, any time of day, some of the stories, even, you know, any country, you know, um, and you're really known for sort of rolling up your own sleeves, but also pushing people to be at their best. So from a leadership perspective, are there things that people can do? Are there things that you notice in your own playbook that you do to draw out the best in people, to really create sort of that dynamic within a team? I think that it's key to recognize that as an individual, you cannot do anything. Hmm. Um, you can only do things as a team. You're only as good as the team that you build and a team that's based on excellence, open communication, and putting the customer at the center of everything. Okay. Uh, a team that uh, is very important to build, particularly when you are building a startup from ground up, uh, it, bring the absolute best players to the table. The first 50, 60 people in your company will be the nucleus and, and, and look for absolute experts, but that are multidimensional, mm -hmm. not just people that can think in a silo, but also if they uh, there are some of those, surround them with also people that are experts but have a multidimensional view. Once you have them, you keep them. And be radically honest about where you are, what are your goals, and what's holding us back. Mm -hmm. There is no room for hurt feelings. You're not trying to win a beauty contest. You're not trying to uh, be this perfect person. Uh, it's it's very honest to be respectful, but always be honest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Treat others the way you would like to be treated. And that's, I've been very fortunate that I have been treated as an equal by, by partners in business and my colleagues at work uh, and those that I've worked with for over two and a half decades. And most importantly, your customers are your lifeblood. Mm. Uh, your best advisors, your greatest champions. Don't view them as a transaction. Don't view them as a purchase order, but view them as part of your team. Yeah. Uh, and they are the most important factor in your success. Mm -hmm. And so many companies will view that as an afterthought, which I think is a disaster. It's really a recipe for disaster. So the sooner you can go get your customer uh, 
uh, focus going in as you start your business and you make it part of the organization's bloodstream and the way the organization thinks. Uh, those are all the elements I would advise people to, to think about in terms of how to get the best out of people. Because yeah. when you pose something through the lens of a customer, everyone, all the people that you work with uh, are all concentrating on that. They're not worried about what hour of day it is or which part of the world do I need to go to or it's we are go out there to go solve for something that is needed right. in the market and by our customers. Then I think then you can rally the right sets of people behind the cause that you are. Right. And I, I couldn't agree more. And what you said about being radically honest, you know, I think um, the other thing that you do is you're consistently radically honest. And to your point, this is not um, personal. It's not emotional. Um, this is about making sure we get it right. Exactly. And people, people have come to expect and appreciate that about you. They know exactly where you stand. They know that when you give them direction, you are absolutely going to be honest with them. You've got their best interest in mind. And you're also looking at big picture in the, in the client, the customer themselves. And when you show up consistently that way, uh, which I can only imagine how tired you are and how difficult that is. But when you do it, <laughs> it's amazing. And and just again, outside looking in, I know the stories. You know, I get to be part of these conversations when you're not in the room of just how loyal people are to you and how excited they are for you, for Pensando, for everything that you really touch because they know there's that genuineness, because they know that you're going to show up for them. You know, and I think that that's such an incredible, powerful piece. You know, a lot of times we talk about diversity and inclusion and equality, and it feels sort of, you know, hippy dippy, lots of rainbows and butterflies. But there's a business perspective to this. There's a business need to to really showing up transparently and showing up vulnerably and honestly, radically honest, like you talk about. So yeah. I, I so appreciate you saying that. I think we get lost in the fact that this is part of that disruption playbook, which is it starts with leadership and it also starts with having the right team. Um, you know, I remember years ago, um, I, I was talking to my leader at the time and I said, I need a team of eight players. And he's like, Sabrina, you can't always have a team of eight players. And I remember thinking that's preposterous. Like, why wouldn't I? I that just doesn't even seem logical or rational to me. So the fact that you say that I, I cannot agree more to, to make sure that you find those dynamic people. Again, we're seeing diverse ideas, diverse people, people with creative big backgrounds um, being so incredibly centric to your point, the nucleus of what you're building, which I think a lot of times we kind of get stuck in this rut and don't realize how central that is to disruption and to innovation. So I, I just love that you said that. I knew that I wouldn't run. I, I knew I wouldn't have enough time. I I just so appreciate these insights and your, again, your radical honesty. So we just, in closing, I've got one more question for you. You know, we just wrote this guide for men and women in technology. And we pulled, you know, a bunch of executives and asked them if you had one or, you know, up to three top tips if you were going to talk to, you know, young Sony or men and women looking to get into tech or innovate, what's sort of that one tip that you would tell yourself or them? Uh, you know, I, I have two tips. I would say um, uh, tip number one would be perseverance. Mm -hmm. Always, always persevere your passion. Don't give up. Uh, be think about that wave by the beach, you know, which always keeps coming and crashing on the shores. They so have that visual when you think about perseverance. Think about how persevering the ocean is, yeah. right? Bring some of those elements into your characteristic. And the second thing I think is leadership. Learn to communicate effectively at a very young age with your peers, with your superiors, and with the people that are and your colleagues that are working at a lower level in an organization where the real work happens the sooner you learn to communicate it's a very subtle thing when you're in your 20s and you are learning how to communicate and working on that communication effectively 
you pave the path to becoming a leader. Mm. It's a foundational element, uh, and I encourage everyone. I even encourage my children. Yeah. Um, uh, and and now they are men. They are adult, grown, married men. Yeah. Um, but for me, that is a very important element. Is yeah. communication, which is foundational to building uh, leadership qualities. Right. And you know, Warren Buffett talks about this all the time. Um, where it was probably the first class he really ever took. I think it is the first class he ever took was, um, you know, on leadership communication, you know, yeah. and public speaking even, which back then, you know, it looked a little bit differently. But, you know, it's so critical and there's so much to be said about that alone. We could do a whole live just on that. So with that, I know we're out of time. Sony, thank you. Thank you, Thank so you much. Sabrina. It's been so much fun. I'm loving to see all the feedback. Uh, we can't wait to see what you do next. Thank you. Thank you very much. You Thanks. take care, Sabrina. You Bye -bye. too. Bye, everyone.